you watch every single coding video, your YouTube homepage is filled with motivational type videos, and you have read every single coding interview book, and yet you still freeze when the interviewer throws a new question at you. Ever wished you had a treasure map for the vast sea of algorithms? Say hello to the ultimate flowchart, your personal leak code compass. Upon examining a variety of problems associated with linear sequences like arrays and strings, we've discovered that there are multiple recurring correlations between the algorithms and patterns present within these problems. With these patterns in mind, we have created an all-encompassing flowchart specially designed to help you in determining the most appropriate algorithm for tackling problems related to linear sequences. In this video, we'll not only introduce you to our groundbreaking flowchart, but also demonstrate its effectiveness by navigating through classical leap code problems and showing how to identify key patterns. Make sure to check out this flowchart at algo.monster slash flowchart. Using the flowchart is a simple and efficient process. Begin at the tree's root, where you'll find the initial diamond node with a question. Answer the question and move along the corresponding yes or no branch. To ensure a smooth experience, we've added detailed explanations and examples on the side panel that shed light on each condition, making it even easier to follow along. Progress through the flowchart by answering questions and following the branches until you reach a leaf node, at which point you'll discover the perfect algorithm suited for your problem. With this helpful flowchart at your fingertips, the process of algorithm selection has become a much more approachable task. The task seems simple, doesn't it? Let's examine a sample problem to better understand it. Given a binary array nums and an integer k, return the maximum number of consecutive ones in the array if you can flip at most k zeros. In this problem, we can observe the keyword consecutive, which suggests a relation to subarrays. As a result, we should refer to the subarray node in our flowchart. Given that this problem does not explicitly involve sums, it is more appropriate to consider the sliding window technique. Let's try another example. You are given an m by n integer array grid. There is a robot initially located at the top left corner. The robot tries to move to the bottom right corner. The robot can only move either down or right at any point in time. An obstacle and space are marked as 1 or 0 respectively in grid. A path that the robot takes cannot include any square that is an obstacle. Return the number of possible unique paths that the robot can take to reach the bottom right corner. In this problem, we can identify that it requires us to return the number of something an indication that this task is a counting type problem. We will then refer to our flowcharts counting node for guidance. It's important to note that using a brute force approach would be inefficient here, as the grid size scales to 100. Therefore, we'll navigate to our flowcharts dynamic programming node. Let's explore a different problem. Given n pairs of parentheses, write a function to generate all combinations of well-formed parentheses. We can observe that the problem constraints are quite small. Precisely speaking, n doesn't exceed 8. Because of this, our attention should be on the small constraints node in the flowchart. Next, we need to consider if a straightforward brute force solution could be successful. At each index in the string, we have the option of inserting either an opening or closing bracket. Therefore, we should account for 2 to the power of x strings in total, where x is the length of the string. Given that n is less than or equal to 8, the length of the string is less or equal to 2 times n, which is 16. Thus, a brute force algorithm that checks all potential strings will be sufficient to solve the problem. Let's do one final example. You are given a zero indexed integer array candies. Each element in the array denotes a pile of candies of size candies i. You can divide each pile into any number of subpiles, but you cannot merge two piles together. You are also given an integer k. You should allocate piles of candies to k children such that each child gets the same number of candies. Each child can take at most one pile of candies, and some piles of candies may go unused. Return the maximum number of candies each child can get. Notice that the problem statement is asking for the maximum number of candies each child will receive. We can classify this problem as a maximum or minimum problem in our flowchart. Additionally, we can observe a monotonic property in the problem. If it's feasible for each child to receive C candies for a certain value C, then it is always possible for each child to receive C-1 candies. From this observation and our flowchart, we can deduce that binary search is a viable strategy to solve this problem. Keep in mind, this algorithm flowchart is specifically designed to solve problems related to sequences, which make up a large portion of the problems on Leap Code. Over the coming weeks, we plan to publish videos showcasing problem solving using this handy flowchart. 
We value your feedback, so please let us know if you find this tool useful. Your input will help guide to create another specialized flowchart dedicated to tackling graph-related problems. Before we wrap up, Kevin and I will do a complete walkthrough of the flowchart. All right, so let's uh, walk through the flowchart from top to bottom here. The first one is need to solve a case smallest or largest. What's this one about, Kevin? For this one, I think pretty simple. In the problem, they'll ask you spe um, specifically to solve for the kth smallest or kth largest value or element of some problem. And you can notice this by just searching for the phrase a most frequent here, for example, or kth smallest element, most k closest. They're all about the same phrase. And once you've identified this, then you can put this in the kth smallest or largest category. Right. I guess the, the important thing is k, right? It's not the first one or the, the smallest one or the largest. If in that case, you can just find it directly by traversing, right? And also it's not, say, sorting the ent entire array. You want every single position. You only want a case, right? That's where heap is fast. So when you say case, maybe nine out of 10 is, is, is heap. It could be sorting though, sometimes. Let's take a look at the next one, involve linked list. This one is a classic. There are probably only a handful of uh, linked list problems that you can practice in a couple of days. There is only limited variations here. Uh, how do we do this one? For a linked list problem, most of the time, they'll just test some linked list traversal by just getting a pointer and iterating through the linked list. But, ho but however, sometimes you might need to use two pointers, um, which is very similar to just using one pointer. You're just using two pointers instead of one. That's how we got this idea here. Right. Awesome. And moving forward, next one, small constraint bound. What does this mean? For small constraints or bounds, here to get a problem in this category, we want to go to the bottom of a problem statement and look for the constraints. For example, in this problem, here are the constraints, and usually you want to look at the length of the array, or the integer n for most cases. And typically we would say a variable with constraints less, less or equal to 500 will be small. For example, here this one's 100, this one's really small, it's only up to 9, this one's up to 300, and here's 100. If you look at this constraint here, and you can see that it's less than or equal to 500, you put this in the small constraints or bounds category. Now, right. after putting in this category, the first thing you want to do is consider whether or not brute force is applicable. For brute force, you want to see if the constraints are really small. Since brute force is really slow, it will only be fast enough on problems where the constraints are really small. For example, this one. Here, n is really small, it's only up to 9, and this is very clear that brute force will be used. And typically, if brute force isn't a valid solution or if it's too slow, you would want to consider dynamic programming. And it would al always almost be, sorry, it would almost always be the correct approach if it isn't brute force. Right. So just, just to get, give a sense of uh, what a constraint normally looks like, normally for most problem is maybe around 10 to the power of 5 to 10, 10 to the power of 9. So when you have 100 or 9, that's extremely small for this sort of thing. And if you want, if you're curious about how we derived this mapping from the constraint to algorithm, you can watch that video here. And also for solving dynamic programming, we have another dedicated one and a half hour video you can check out. All right, let's move on to the next one uh, about subarrays or substrings. This one is uh, most of the time you would just say, you know, sub subarrays or substrings in the problem description, right? Like you see here. And that's very obvious. Occasionally it's somewhat implicit, right? For example, here, it could be rectangle instead. And here a rectangle just means like a 2D subarray, which is like a sub matrix. And that's pretty similar to subarray. And typically it'll use the same approach. And that's why we put it in the same category. Right, and, uh, and the next decision we need to make is deals with sum or additives. What does this mean? To figure out whether a problem should be in this category, we should look at the problem statement and look for the keyword sum. For example, here, they want max sum of a rectangle. They want sum of elements. Here's summation. Here's the keyword sum in the problem. We would put it in this category. Now, if a problem falls in this category, we can think of prefix sums. So essentially, first, a prefix is just a subarray that starts from the beginning of the array. And a prefix sum technique here 
is just calculating the sum of every single prefix of the array. And the reason why this is useful is because if you compute all the sums uh, of every prefix, you can calculate the sum of every single subarray in constant time. You can look at our article here, but this technique is pretty useful. However, it's not that common. If a problem uses subarrays, sorry, if a problem involves subarrays or substrings, typically you would want to consider the sliding window approach. However, um, if it deals with sums, prefix sums, um, applying prefix sums could make it a lot easier. Right. So it's, it's subarray problems are normally sliding windows, but if you just do sliding window, sometimes you, it's the, the time limit will still exceed because you are doing repeated computations on sums. This is where prefix sum comes in handy. Right. Okay. Moving on to the next one, calculating max min or something. This is a classic. I feel like half the problem on Leetcode are about calculating min or max. When you see a problem asking for min max, it's normally quite obvious, right? What's the minimum of something and what's the largest and what's the shortest? something along along those lines right and then if you do see this the first thing you want to consider is monotonic condition which we have a video on monotonic stacks that sort of explain what monotonic condition is what it means is uh, simply speaking say you have an array of uh, numbers and if you traverse from the left to the right either the numbers are going up monotonically or it's going down monotonically and it doesn't have a local maximum or local minimum sort of thing right we call that in a sorted array, your basic binary search problem, which is just binary search for number in a sorted array, the array is monotonic because it's sorted, which means it's increasing from the left to the right as you go through the array. Now, not in a problem, you're not going to always be given this monotonic condition in implicit. Uh, like for example, in the form of a function maybe. And that's where you have to look for the monotonic condition and where it might not be so obvious. But if that is the case, you would want to consider binary search. Right. That's the fastest way. Log in. And the next one is if you don't have a monotonic condition, then you consider. Essentially here, what this means is you just want to try to, and to figure out if there's a dynamic programming approach, you just want to try out a dynamic programming solution, which just involves calculating the answer for the current problem by solving a bunch of sub problems. And that's why we have this condition here. And so if the problem isn't dynamic programming, you want to try greedy. And essentially what greedy is, is at every single step or state, you want to pick the best option. And picking the best option continuously will give you your final maximum or minimum answer. Right. Uh, moving on to the next one, asking for a number of ways. This one is also quite common. Uh, you say, how many ways are there to arrange some sort of a string or the combinations? How many solutions are there to a particular problem? This sort of thing, right? And if the problem asks number of something or asks you to count something, the first thing you want to consider is brute force. And that's because we noticed that in a lot of counting problems, typically you might see a problem with really small constraints. And that goes back to a node up here, which is also brute force. And so if you see a counting problem, first thing you want to check is how big the constraints are. And if the constraints are really small and brute force is fast enough, then you should run a brute force algorithm. And if that isn't the case, similarly here, you want to use dynamic programming. And it's right. almost always sense. the case. Right. So for and, and for counting problems, normally it's a uh, combinatorial problems and, and combinatorial problems have very high time complexity in general. This is where the similarity to a small constraint comes in. Right? And next one, multiple sequences. What's this one about? this one usually you can figure out the problem falls in this category if it gives you two sequences for example here given a string s and a string array dictionary here a string star and string end and once you're given these two sequences the problem might ask you to calculate some value that's related to these two sequences and that's when we would put a problem into this category right yes, yes. so this one is quite somewhat obvious i would say because uh, for some of the classic longest common subsequence, we have two strings. So it's actually quite obvious when you see it. And yeah. the one you want to see is monotonic condition. Uh, we just covered that, right? Actually, you want to look for some property that's like always increasing or always decreasing. And if that's the case, you will want to use two pointers. Since two pointers works on sorted arrays, for example, usually if you have some monotonic property, 
two pointers would work well on it, and that's why and that's why we have two pointers here. Wait, but in this two pointer, why don't we use uh, binary search? Because it's two sequences. You, you don't. It would be hard to do binary search. I guess you have two sequences. So you you have two, one pointer on each sequence. Most of the time, you would have a pointer on each sequence. I think most of the time, two pointers would work, and. Yeah. Here you'll just have one pointer on the first sequence and a pointer on the second sequence. And that's why we have two pointers okay. here. Right, and can split into sub problem. That's just what we discussed DP, right? Moving okay, along, next one, find or enumerate indices. This one is a little bit opaque. What does this mean? So this one is a bit rare. Essentially, for this type of problem, they'll ask you to count pairs of elements in the array that satisfy some property. Usually, they'll ask you to identify a pair of elements that satisfy some property, for example, two sum, or they may ask you to count the number of pairs that satisfy some property. And for problems that fall in this category, it could be count pairs or something, count quadruplets, anything similar to that. For example, here, right. pick two numbers that satisfy this property, find number of triplets, pairs here, anything like that you would put in this right. category. Interesting. And then again monotonic condition and so in this case it will be mostly two point if you don't have a branch out here you can just go to two pointer directly right <laughs> i think for these type of problems it might also be common where hash map is used for example in the two sum problem you could sort it and that's where the monotonic condition comes from and then run uh, two pointers however right, hash right, map right. is also um an alternate solution so that's a common one. One memory required. This one, this one is very obvious, but also pretty rare. That just means in the description it says use constant memory. So they don't want you to use extra data structure like a hash map or anything. Exactly. And this can also happen during an interview. For example, the interviewer might say, oh, can you optimize this to use constant memory? And that's where you would go through this branch and go to two pointers. One also, Sorry. One thing we should also mention is that binary search also uses constant memory. However, most of these problems where they ask to use constant memory use two pointers. That's something you should also consider. Right. Essentially, anything that does not require extra memory, uh, like a, you can do a sorting. Basically, you have pointer on things. You don't want to create extra things. Exactly.